Hi, good morning. Thank you for bearing with us as we got the live stream going. Welcome this morning to Hope Church Goldthorpe. Um, welcome if you're joining us online as well. And welcome if you're here for the first time. It's great to have you with us as well. This morning, I'd like us to start by just having a look at this verse, these two verses from the Bible that are on the screen behind me. The verses from Romans chapter 3, and I'll just read out the, the start of them for us now. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. There's the reason that we can be confident that we are right with God when we come together this morning. It's not because we've all been really good this week. It's not because we've all behaved or we've all done some good deeds this week. It's because we're made right with God because of Jesus, because of his shedding of blood. And that gives us such confidence today that when we meet together, we are his people. We belong to him. He loves us and cares for us. We are his people this morning. And so if you believe that, join with me in our opening prayer this morning on the service sheet. And we pray together as God's people. Loving Lord, we meet as your people around your word. Please help us by your Holy Spirit to hear your truth so that we will know you better and love you more. Amen. We do need his help, don't we? Not just this morning to know him better and love him more, but every day of our lives we need his help. And he is so, so much greater than us. I've got a little speck of dust here that I got from the floor earlier on. Can anybody see this speck of dust on my finger? Can anybody see it? It's tiny. I can barely see it. I could just about see it, but there's no way you're going to see it over there. And compared to God, that's what we are like. We are so tiny, and he is massive, bigger than this school compared to that, grain of, that little speck of dust on my finger. He is massive and he cares for us and loves us and wants to help us. So we are crazy when we don't pray to him and ask him for help because he's so much greater and so much more powerful than anything else that we could do. And um, so let's sing our first song together. Father, you are King of heaven. I remind each other why it's so good to pray. And hopefully this will help us to pray today and all this week as we remember who our father is. Let's stand to sing. of heaven and greater than a soul. Everything is in your hands from you try down to small. Sometimes I forget that I can do things on my own. Please now help me pray to you and trust in you alone. It's like an earthworm trying to do press-ups, like a potato trying to swim. Like a mountain trying to brush its teeth when we don't rely on him. When we pray, we trust our Father, that's what Jesus said. So I'll stop trusting in myself and pray to God instead. Father, help me now to pray and spend some time with you. Father, you are always good in all you say and do. Sometimes I forget that I can share what's on my mind. Please now help me pray to you, knowing you are kind. It's like an earthworm trying to do press-ups, like a potato trying to swim. Like a mountain trying to brush its teeth, don't rely on him when we pray we trust our father that's what jesus said so i'll stop trusting in myself and pray to god instead it's like an earthworm trying to do press-ups like a potato trying to swim like a mountain trying to brush its teeth when we don't rely on him when we pray, we trust our Father, that's what Jesus said. 
So I stop trusting in myself and pray to God instead. Well, let's have a look at that Bible verse that we started with again on the screen. Just going to read the whole verse to us now, the whole two verses. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and didn't punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. These are great words that we can think about today as we come to confess our sins. They say that God was being fair when he left so many sins unpunished for years and years and years. Long before Jesus came, for hundreds of years, people had been sinning and God hadn't been punishing them. And it just looked like it was maybe unjust. It looked like God was being unfair, but God had a plan to punish all sin. And when we trust in Jesus, our sins are punished, but in Jesus shedding his blood and not in any punishment of us. It's a wonderful truth and amazing for us to remember. As we look at Psalm 5 today, let's remember that, as Chris teaches us as well, that there were so many sins done before Jesus, but God was not being unfair by not punishing them. He had a plan to include them in what he did in the time of Jesus. When we see God not punishing sin, even today, we might think that means he's not bothered. Does he not really care about sin? Is he... Is he not really that fussed whether or not we sin? Because he doesn't seem to do very much about it sometimes. Or is he not good? Is he not fair? Does he, does he punish some people and not others, like some sort of unjust judge? Well, God is good. God is fair. He is righteous. And he always had a plan to punish sin. His plan was to present Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. His one and only loved, precious, perfect son, as a sacrifice for our sin. So that those of us who believe that Jesus sacrificed his life can be forgiven. So let's confess our sins to him now, knowing that he will forgive us, because that has always been his plan to present Jesus as our sacrifice for sin. We're going to use the confession on the sheets. Um, if you're not a reader yet, that is fine. Why don't you say sorry to God for your sins this week as well? You don't need to use these words if you'd rather not. But if you can, let's join with these words. I'll read the words in light type and then join in over the page with those in bold. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Bible encourages us to admit our many sins. God warns us not to hide them from him, but humbly to confess them so that he may forgive us through his never ending goodness and mercy. Let us then draw near to him with confidence, saying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have wandered from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed our own thoughts and desires. We have not done the right things that we should have done, and we have continued to do wrong things. We admit that we have sinned and ask for your mercy. As you have promised, please forgive us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and help us each day to live godly and obedient lives that bring glory and honour to your holy name. Amen. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life. That is what we can all know now, that if we believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shed his blood for you and me, we are right with God, 100% totally right with him in his good books because of what Jesus has done for us. We're going to say some more truths about God, about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together now. Um, and we're going to use the words of the creed, which will be up on the screen and on the service cards. 
If you can uh, stand, then f- uh, feel free to stand with me now and we'll say these words together. Christians, do you believe and trust in God the Father who created and rules the world? I believe and trust in him. Christian, do you believe in God the Son who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit who gives life to the people of God and makes Jesus known in the world? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of God's people, the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a seat again. During our next song, the children are going to head out for Sunday Club with Mira and Carol. Um, So let's pray for the children now before they head out. Father, thank you that um, you speak to us, every one of us, whatever our age and background. Father, thank you that you have words today for these children to hear from the parable of the sower in Matthew. Father, we pray that you would help them to understand those and please would they welcome your word, would they trust it and obey it and follow Jesus all the days of their lives. Amen. Great, so the song we're going to sing um, as the children head out is In Christ Alone. It's a song that admits that God is angry at sin. He's not unjust. He doesn't, he's not, not bothered about sin. He does care. He's angry about sin. But it says, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. God's anger at sin was satisfied on the cross of Christ. So let's stand to sing if you can. My strength, my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, from through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my only of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live Light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ oh, and life and fear and death this is the power of Christ in me first cry to fall. 
destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No great words, aren't they? No guilt in life, no fear in death. Here in the power of Christ we stand. Well, just got some notices to share now. This week, um, it will, yeah, we're continuing with the, we're still in the summer holidays, so check in with your life group to see if they're doing anything this week. I know some of them are meeting up together, um, but otherwise we'll be back together next Sunday. Next Sunday is going to be Lord's Supper together, so um, come prepared for that. Maybe have a read over uh, the story of the cross before you come. Think again about what Jesus has done for us. So when we come to remember him shedding his blood, him giving his, his life for us um, and share it in the Lord's Supper together. We'll be ready to do that and encourage each other in that way. Um, after church next week, um, 4.45 in the afternoon, there's going to be a church tea um, at Chris and Anna's house at Parkgate. So everybody's welcome there. Um, food and drink will be provided. If you want to bring anything with you, just have a word with Anna and that would be really appreciated too. Um, but 4.45 next Sunday is the next church tea. And then there are some other notices just on the sheets as well, and those timings are on the bottom of the service sheets too, so you can remember them. Jesus said that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. He leads us and guides us and protects us like a shepherd does over the sheep that he cares for. And he goes one more step in giving up his life for us. That's, that's what we've thought about as we've thought about sin today and what Jesus has done for us. Let's remember now how he is our shepherd, even today, not just in giving his life, though most of all in that way, but also in caring for us and guiding us and leading us in righteousness day by day. Let's stand to sing if we can, the Lord is my shepherd. my shepherd I'll not want he makes me lie in pastures green he leads me by the still still waters his goodness restores my soul and I will trust in you alone will trust in you alone for your endless mercy follows me your goodness will lead me home he guides my ways in righteousness and he anoints my with oil and my cup it overflows with joy I feast on his pure delight and I will trust in you alone and I will trust in you alone for your endless mercy he follows me, your goodness will lead me home. And though I walk the darkest path, I will not fear the evil one, for you are with me and your rod and 
staff are the comfort I need to know, and I will trust will lead me home. We're going to have our Bible reading now. So if you want to turn to Psalm 5, Nikki's going to come up and read it for us. Thanks, Nikki. Psalm 5, which I think is on page 544. In the church bible psalm 5 let me pray for us um, as we listen to god's word being read father thank you so much again that you are a speaking god who cares about us and wants to feed us today with the food of your word please help us to listen to it and to seek to obey it and to love it and delight in it as well amen psalm 5 for the director of music, for Pipes, Psalm of David. Listen to my words, Lord, consider my lament. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God, for to you I pray. In the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my requests before you and wait expectantly. For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness, with you, Evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies, the bloodthirsty and deceitful. You, Lord, detest. But I, by your great love, come into your house. In reverence I bow down towards your holy temple. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Not a word from their mouth can be trusted. Their heart is filled with malice. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they tell lies. Declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favour as with a shield. Well, thank you, Nikki, for reading to us. And... Uh... If you've not been introduced, my name is Chris. Uh, good morning to you if you're watching online. Good morning to you. Yeah, thank you, Andy, for praying as well for us as we are coming to God's word together. I hope you've still got that passage open, Psalm 5. Uh, it's going to be helpful for us to be able to see that as we're looking at it this morning. It'll be fine. Um, I looked around at uh, the, the faces that were sort of around me on the mountainside, and I, I said, it'll be fine. I was with my parents, and uh, I was with my uh, brother-in-law, uh, no, sorry, my brother and his wife, on a, on a mountain. We were in Wales, and uh, we climbed up to the top of this hill, and the mist and the clouds had descended, and we couldn't see more than, I don't know, 50 meters in front of us. And uh, well, we certainly couldn't see the way down. Well, not the way I wanted us to go anyway. Uh, and so because we couldn't see, uh, there I was with map and compass trying to get us down. It'll be fine, I said. But it had taken us, this route, to an increasingly steep bit of the mountain. And my family were getting worried. It'll be fine. That's what I thought. Looking back now, I know that it wasn't fine. I was taking us on a route that, that would have been great in the sunshine, 
to the scene where we're going. It'd be lovely. In the mist, it was downright dangerous. Thankfully, my brother persuaded me that we should take a different route down the mountain. A bit longer, but much safer. And so we all made it down in one piece. Well, all apart from my pride, which had taken quite a knocking. Thinking that I knew best had blinded to the danger that we were facing. Now, I'd have to say that I've learned my lesson. But as I've been looking at Psalm 5 over the last few days, weeks, I've realized that actually I'm, I'm still no better. And I reckon it might be for us here today. Remember, Jesus often warned us to be on our guard. And his friend and the apostle Peter said, be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around looking, um, sorry, like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith. So let us be strengthened in our faith by Psalm 5. And firstly, we're going to see that there is real danger all around us. There is real danger all around us. Um, I, I hope you saw, didn't you, the, the sense of urgency in this prayer. Did you see it? Just look at he, what he wants God to do in the beginning of this prayer in Psalm 5. He wants God to listen, uh, to consider, to, to hear and pay attention. And he's waiting expectantly in verse 3 as well. And did you see the types of praying he's going for? Uh, the words he uses, words, uh, he uses uh, lament or, or, or sighing or murmuring. He, he's crying out. He's laying his requests. You see, when, when something is urgent and, and, and desperate, you, you use all means possible, don't you, to get your message across. Just think about activists and campaigners. What do they do? They, they go on rallies, they, they sign petitions, they write letters, they go to demonstrations, they, any means possible, because it's urgent and desperate. But David knows no human, no council or government can help him. For the danger he's facing, he needs a higher power. And you see who he talks to? Listen to my words, Lord. Hear my cry for help, my King and my God. Here's the man who comes with urgency and desperation. But why? Why the urgency and desperation? Well, we see that at the end of the psalm, don't we? Look at verses 11 and 12. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection for them. You surround them with your favour as with a shield. Protection. Shield. There's, a, there's an urgent need, a desperation here, isn't there? Just think about why we drive on the left in this country. I don't know whether you know why we drive on the left in this country. It's because of history. A long time ago, before art, when you travelled around by horse, well, you would always approach others and you would keep on the left. The right. I'm sorry, the microphone dropping in and out. Maybe I'll abandon this one and move on to this one. So you'd always approach um, riders on the left, wouldn't you? You'd always approach other riders on the left with you on the right. Why? Because well, you wouldn't know them. You wouldn't know whether they were friendly or not. And therefore, you'd need to keep them on the side of your sword arm so you can defend yourself in case of attack. Danger is lurking anywhere. So you always had your sword ready for defense and you keep on the left so it was available. Well, David says uh, that God's people need a defense, protection spread over them, a shield. Why? Because there's, there's danger lurking everywhere. There's real danger all around us. I was asking myself this question. Why don't I pray urgently and desperately? I mean, I mean sometimes I'm do, I do. When, you know, when the chips are down, you know, then I pray urgently and desperately. But daily, each morning, as this psalm suggests, 
See, too often I'm, I'm just unaware of the danger that I'm in. Like when I was up on that mountain in the mist. Too often I'm comfortable with sin, like it's no big deal. Most of the time I just think I can manage. Perhaps your experience is the same as mine. In fact, some of you, maybe if you're not sure about Jesus and Christianity, to you, this kind of urgent, desperate behavior, it, it just seems completely weird. Like, desperate cries and murmurs and petitions to God. But it's what, what you'd expect from someone who really was facing huge danger and great desperation. It's just plain weird otherwise. But that's exactly the point. Maybe we're unaware of the danger we're in. There is real danger all around us. But this psalm grows our faith because it tells us also that there is real hope for rescue. There is real hope for rescue. You see, David's prayer might be urgent, but he's also confident, isn't he? Because he says this is prayer that is in line with God's character. Okay, he's urgent because he sees true danger all around him for what it is. But he's confident because he sees there is true hope for rescue. You see, God, he says, is opposed to evil people. God is opposed to evil people. We can't avoid this truth. It's really clear there isn't in the text of the psalm. Just listen again to verses four to six. For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people cannot stand. So with you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful you, Lord, detest. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, God hates the sin, but loves the sinner, or, or something similar. But what these words in this psalm show is that at best, is only a half truth. I mean, God does love the sin. And the Bible tells us the wonderful story of a God who so loved the world. And in it's all its mess and sin, he loved it so much that he sent his son to save whoever trusts in him. God loves the sinner. But at the same time, we're told God hates those who do wrong. He detests the bloodthirsty and deceitful, that evil people are not to be his guests. See, what, what are we to make of all of this, do you think? Well, actually, this is a very good thing. This is a very good thing. This is why David is both urgent and confident in his prayer, because David is, in a sense, praising God that he is opposed to evil people. You see, Imagine a world where there was no hatred of what is wrong. Where instead of hatred to what is wrong, there is indifference to evil and evil do. It's just indifference. Who cares? It just doesn't matter. In fact, this might help us understand a little bit about what's going on in Afghanistan at the moment. Why is it that, that there can be no authority that can sustain a government in, in Afghanistan? Because I think, and I'm no expert, but it seems that the people of Afghanistan are stuck between two corrupt regimes. You see, it's either the Taliban or the West at the moment. And in both cases, there is indifference to evil, isn't there? The, the ordinary Afghan on the street. They, they fear indifference to evil from the West and our excess and our indifference to immorality. But then, of course, they also fear the indifference to evil that it's seen in the Taliban's violence and evil treatment of women. See, I'm not an expert, as I say, but I reckon that one of the problems with our attempts as the West to, to help in Afghanistan is our own blindness and our own indifference to the evils in our own society. Who are we in the West to think we can offer the Afghan people a winning solution to their troubles? But you see, with God, 
There is no indifference to any evil person. No indifference to wrongdoers, no indifference to liars, no indifference to the excesses of our society, no indifference to the arrogant, the deceitful, the violent. He despises their wicked characters and actions. He's opposed to them. Now, when you and I face danger, who are we going to call? We call on the people who can help, don't we? We call on the people who are going to help. It's the, other, the other week, we had a scrubland fire. I think I told you about this before. We had a scrubland fire behind our house. And there was only one number we phoned when we had a fire in the scrubland behind our house. And it, it wasn't the council to find out whose land it was. It wasn't the estate agent to find out how much our house price was going to be dropped by having a fire outside by the damage. It wasn't the water board to find out whether there's enough water to put out the fire. There's only one number you phone when you've got a fire. It's the fire brigade. Because they're the ones you want to call. Because they're the ones who stand in opposition to fire. That's their job. But if your danger isn't fire, but evil all around you and within, then who are you going to call? You need to call someone who actually stands opposed to evil. Someone who is not indifferent to evil. Someone who can do something about it. You see, that's what verse 10 is about. Just look again at verse 10. He, David prays, declare them guilty, O God. Let their intrigues be their downfall. Banish them for their many sins, for they have rebelled against you. You see, David, he's not being vindictive or revengeful. He's asking for the dangerous fires all around him to be put out. And he has real hope for rescue because of that. And I want us to see this morning, I want us to see this boy, that, that, that Jesus himself underlines God's opposition to evil people. Jesus underlines this. It might be too small to probably see on the screen, but just listen to Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 23, as he is condemning some of the religious leaders of his day. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Uh, woe to you, teachers of the law. And Pharisees, you hypocrites, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Woe to you, teach the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-endurance. Woe to you, teach the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. And he goes on, doesn't he? He goes on, Jesus, you see, he stood opposed to evil people. In fact, in fact, Jesus was so opposed to evil people that he did something about it. His whole, his whole purpose in coming to earth was a rescue mission, a rescue mission to rescue people from God himself. Jesus is God saving us from God? That's why the Bible is the only place that tells us about the offer of the real hope of rescue, because it tells us about the God who is so opposed to evil people that he did something about it. There's no real help for rescue anywhere else. No one knows justice like God knows justice. And no one else does justice like God does justice, as we saw in Romans, uh, throughout the early part of our service. And so it is to Jesus that we must turn. Who else can help us? When we recognize the real danger all around us, we need verse two on our lips. Hear my cry for help, my King, my God. For to you, I pray. For to you, who hates wickedness, I pray for ourselves, 
for our children, for our loved ones, for our community, for our world. There is real hope for rescue. Lastly, this morning, we want us to strengthen our faith by seeing that there is real help for the humble. Because perhaps you have actually spotted a problem so far with what we've thought about. I, I think here's the problem. Why is it that David, the writer of this song, seems to be able to put himself in a different group to all the others all around him? He's different, he says, to the wrongdoers that God opposes. Look at verse 3. He says, in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice. Well, why? Why? Why should God hear David's voice? But doesn't David sound a little bit arrogant here? Oh, God's going to hear me. I'm all right. I'm not one of those evil people. Or, or perhaps David, bless him, he's just a little bit naive. He's a bit wet behind the ears. He hasn't realized that humans are capable of real evil, has he? Perhaps you know people like that, actually. They, they either think that basically, yeah, they're okay. Or, or they haven't realized, actually, that they are capable of real evil. Maybe you're not a Christian, and actually, this is what you think about Christians. Like, they're either net sort of arrogant hypocrites, or they're just a bit naive. But I think we need to take a closer look, because that doesn't quite fit. You know, we've seen already David knows that real evil exists, and we've seen that he knows that the arrogant cannot stand in God's presence. And the whole reason for his prayer is for protection from joining in with them. So let's check out verse 7. Here's what makes the difference. Verse 7, but I, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, I bow down towards your holy temple. The house that David's talking about isn't a palace for a god. It's the temple in Jerusalem. And whenever we hear about God's holy temple in Jerusalem in the Bible, we need to think about God drawing near to us and us drawing near to him through sacrifice. Sacrifice. One life given in the place of another. And you see, that's what went on day after day after day in the temple. A sheep, goat, calves killed in the place of people. And also the meat of those animals given to sustain life. Eaten to sustain life. And none of that was the people's idea. It was God's idea by his great love. Verse 7, but I, by your great love, by your great love in providing a way for my evil to be dealt with, I can now come into your house. But with what attitude do you think worshippers should approach God? Not arrogant, not presuming, verse 5, the arrogant cannot stand in your presence. No, but, but humble. Like a humble amazement and reverence. Verse 7, in reverence, I bow down. And for those who approach God like that, there is real help available. Real help to take the next step, not towards wrongdoing and evil, but towards right living. Verse 8, that's why he prays, lead me, Lord, in your righteousness, in your, in your right ways of living because of my enemies. Make your way straight before me. Imagine one day you, you came into some money and you decide you want to do something crazy and you want to climb Mount Everest. It won't be just money you need for that. You need plenty of that as well. Um, it can cost actually apparently as much as £100,000 for everything you need to climb Mount Everest. You don't just need the money though. You, you, need, you need right advice about the right equipment to take. You need advice about the right route to get up, perhaps so you can avoid the queues at the top. You need advice about the right Sherpas, apparently they're called, to guide you to the summit. Now, of course, I mean, you could just go alone, couldn't you? You could busk it. 
You could think you knew best. But you'd be a fool, an arrogant fool. Now, to make a successful attempt to, to climb Everest, other than a lot of money, you need a lot of humility. You need to be prepared to be led, for others to show you the way. And that's verse 8, isn't it? That's verse 8. Living, living life surrounded by danger because we live in an evil world. Well, I need the humility to ask for help. Verse 8, lead me, Lord, in your right paths. Because I don't know the right way to go. I've got enemies all around me. So make your way straight before me. More important to David than his safety or than his comfort is his walking in God's ways. In fact, safety is righteousness. But you only find it when you realize you need it. Just think back to our scrubland fire again. Imagine someone else had called the fire service and, and I decided that we didn't need them. We'd be okay on our own dealing with this fire. And I ran up the road to stop the fire engine. Now, actually, a fire engine is something I never want to come up against. You know, if it's me versus the fire engine, well, it's over in an instant, isn't it? They're, they're massive vehicles carrying tons of water. It'd be, in fact, doubly foolish to try and stop it. The fire's still raging, and now I'm on a collision course with a fire engine. It's ridiculous. But when I say I can't face the fire on my own, there's nothing I can do to stop it. I need a fire brigade. Well, then at that point, the fire engine's no longer a threat. It's the same fire engine, but now I come under its protection. And that's doubly wonderful. Verse 11 and 12. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor as with a shield. You see, there is real help for the humble. And so I invite you today to come to God with humility. Perhaps to some of us listening to this, it, it, it does all sound a little bit far-fetched. Oh, yeah, sure, we, we need a little bit of help from time to time. But danger all around us? God rescuing us from God? It sounds a bit over the top. After all, I'm not really that bad, and I? It's certainly not compared to the really evil people. But I want to ask you, what makes you think that you can trust your own viewpoint? I want to invite you to open your mind and heart to the possibility that actually you're a wee bit biased. And maybe your creator knows you better. I want to invite you to come to God with humility. Or it could be today that you're only too aware of the mess that your life is in. Perhaps you wouldn't describe it as danger, but you certainly are scared or worried. You know you need help, but oh, who's going to help a mess up like you? Why would God help you? But that's exactly what he wants. He wants people to take refuge in him. He longs to spread his wings of protection over you. And so I invite you to come to God with humility. Many of us have seen the danger that is around us. Many of us have heard of the real hope of rescue, and we know there is real help for the humble. And I want to invite you to keep coming to God with humility. This is to be our prayer. This is always our prayer. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness in the right ways you require of me. Make your way straight before me. You see, are you unsure about the future? Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. Are you fearful of temptation? 
Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. Don't know the next step to take. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. Laughed at for being a Christian. Lead me, Lord, in your righteousness. In the quiet of our own hearts now, let's ask the Lord to lead us. And then in a moment, I'm going to take these words of Psalm 5 uh, and pray for our world, our community, and ourselves. For the moment's quiet as we reflect and pray ourselves. So let us pray for our world, let's pray for our community and for ourselves. Lead us, Lord, in your righteousness. Heavenly Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan. Please grant them humility to know that you are in control and would you lead them in right ways of living. As they surrounded so much uh, by actual physical enemies. We pray that you would sustain them and help them to trust you. And may the, their hu humility and calm response to all that is going on point others to you, the God who is in control, or the God who has offered rescue through Jesus. We pray that you would hold back the evil in that land and bring stability so that your church can flourish. One of the, the only hope, Father, for Afghanistan is your gospel. So please, would it spread. And as we think about them, we pray for our own nation. Make us uh, unblind our eyes to our own evils. And may, our, may Christians in our country um, also stand firm in you being led in your righteousness and therefore witnessing to your paths as being the right paths and best paths. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we pray for Goldthorpe and the surrounding villages. Lead us, Lord, in your righteousness. Father, similarly, we pray that you would hold back evil in our communities and let right and good um, happen. Thank you that you give in your common grace the ability for everybody to do what is, is, is good and right to, to bring blessing. But ultimately, we pray that as a church and as Christians, uh, we would bring the true blessing of your gospel to this area. We pray that you would awaken people. Awaken people to their need for you, their urgent and desperate situation. And Heavenly Father, we ask, therefore, that in that state they would come to know the rescue that is found in Jesus. For we ask it in his name. Amen. We pray for ourselves. Lead us, Lord, in your righteousness. Please lead and help Steve and Val. As Steve continues his recovery from his treatment. May you make your way straight before them. Each day sustain them in knowing that you are their God and their King. We pray for those of us who are 
um, supporting and helping people in need at the moment, at those who face bereavement, at those who um, are caring for uh, those who are unwell and ill. Uh, give your strength to, to Nikki, to Adele, to Carol in their roles as um, friends and carers and, uh, and, and, and daughters who are supporting. In, in your kindness, lead them in your righteousness. We pray for children soon to return to school. Father, surrounded by those who do not know, make your way straight before them. And those in workplaces, again, surrounded by those who have no knowledge of, spread your protection over them so they might walk safely in your ways and be a light for you. All these prayers we lift before you, our God and our King, for you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness, but you are a God who has done something about it through the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Chris. It's that humility that we need um, if we're going to sing our last song together. We can say that we can do life on our own, can't we? That we don't need any help. Um, and when we do, we, we, want, we make everything about us. That we, want, we think we can be our own strength and our own wisdom and all that we need in life can come from ourselves. Or we can say to God that you are our everything. God, you are my everything. And that's what our final hymn is all about. It's saying that God... God is our everything. He's our vision. He's our wisdom. He's our breastplate, our sword for the fight, our armor, our shelter, and our great future. And so if that's what you want to say to God, then join with me in this song, which is a prayer to him, saying, Lord, be my everything. Try again. Here we go. my life. Be thou my wisdom, be thou my true word, I ever with thee and thou with me, Lord. Thou my great Father and I thy true Son. fight. Be thou my armor and be thou my might. Be my soul shelter and thou my heights. Raise thou me heavenwards, O power of my power. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only, the first in my heart. High King of heaven, my treasure thou art. Joy to me, bright heaven 
Son, Christ of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision, thou ruler of all. Great, have a seat and welcome back in, kids. Good to have you back with us. Hope you've had a good time together. Um, let's pray together as we close, and then we'll have some refreshments um, for afterwards. It's looking nice and dry outside, so we can have a seat outside and stay around if you can. But let me close with a final prayer. Father, we thank you so much for Psalm 5, for what we've heard today of the real danger that is all around us. Father, we thank you for that rescue that we have in Jesus, a rescue from our own sin, that you save us from your wrath and anger. Father, we pray that you would lead us in righteousness. Please lead us this week, wherever we're going, whatever we're doing, lead us in all that we do in your ways of righteousness. And may we keep trusting in Jesus every day. Amen. <laughs>